Are you developed? Have you undergone a process of development? Development is so understandable, yet so complex. It can mean increasing capacity for knowledge, improvement of physique, or betterment of character. But what does development mean to you? How do you know if you have developed? I've scored 10 goals this season. That's four more than last season. So yes, I've developed on the football pitch. I've improved from a previous standard. You may have scored five goals this season compared to three last season. Have we developed equally? Our previous standard was different and our current standard is different. Yet we have both developed, but we have not developed equally. Development to you does not mean the same as it does to me. Development is political. When we study development, it becomes clear from the outset that what we mean by development differs. Indeed, the continued existence of scholarly debate and international political debate surrounding the development agenda suggests there still to be fundamental differences. Thus, when the question is asked, how do we eradicate poverty? Or, how do we develop the developing world? The very fact that no cohesive definition of what development means is very problematic. And this leads to obstacles to the development process. One fundamental division is whether we mean development in a socio-economic sense or in terms of political and civil rights. Aside from questioning what development means, I'll examine three thematic obstacles infringing upon development outcomes, including democracy, war and policy implementation. Although these themes do provide explanations to development obstacles, perhaps the greatest obstacle to development is the mere fact that development is political. I will attach significance to the lack of universal understanding of what development means, both in a global and local sense, with contradictory forces affecting development outcomes evident within the three themes I will explore. I consider development in terms of a human development approach. The human development approach focuses on the moral imperative of basic needs such as shelter, food and security. One prominent alternative to this is modernisation theory, which prioritises economic growth of countries as paramount to establishing long-term development outcomes. The necessity of democracy as an aspect of development can be questioned when focusing on democracy and development as an analytical paradigm. The rise of China in the last 30 years from a developing country to one of the world's leading economic superpowers, which has reduced Chinese extreme poverty levels from 60.2% in 1990 to only 11.8% in 2009. China's rise in economic prosperity has been facilitated by an authoritarian government which registered a score of 3 out of 10 for the 2012 Democracy Index. It has thus been achieved at the expense of political and civil rights, rights that democracy seek to protect. It has been argued that radical economic development in China would not have been possible if it had a democratic system. Adrian Lethwich has proposed that democracies have an inherent conservative character, meaning they are unable to institute radical change, and he equates the task of development as a rad radical and turbulent process. Furthermore, Bogang He reveals how the totalitarian regime of Mao instituted far-reaching land reforms, even suggesting that peasants' demand for money outweighed their demand for democracy. The Chinese model of, model of development has challenged the Western premise of incorporating democratization as a key factor in development policy making. Therefore, conceptualizing development through modernization theory, which promotes the primacy of socio-economic rights as the greatest determinant of development, then perhaps democracy is an obstacle to achieve that end. Przorski has suggested that democratization is the process of institutionalizing uncertainty, of subjecting all interests to uncertainty, a process which has not occurred in China 
as long-term economic planning has been implemented by stable, albeit authoritarian, government. The short-termist nature of democratic politics, alluded to by Przorski, seeks populism for votes at elections, as opposing political parties compete over differing sets of ideas. The Chinese model of development reveals that the democratic process, although providing people power and legitimate government in the development context, can be seen as an obstacle for sustained long-term economic development. Even advocates for democratization, such as Mark Wounds, suggest that it's difficult and dangerous assertion to make that democratization ensures development. His case study of Tanzania reveals that despite official promotion of democracy in the 1990s, the legislature has not challenged the executive dominance and there have been weak levels of government accountability over failed development objectives. Furthermore, his promotion of bottom-up democratisation has been seen to fail in Tanzania, as local politicians in the Mwanza and Bagamova areas um, have fought with each other over a personal gain thus jeopardising development outcomes. This argument has been made to counter the dominant Western narrative the necessity of democratisation in, in accompanying development. Whilst it is difficult to argue against the emancipatory potential of democracy as it can lead to development goals of citizenship and empowerment, it is clear that when focusing on socio-economic development goals such as employment or literacy rates, semi-authoritarian systems can appear equally if not more effective in enabling radical change. Considering Lefwich and Brzezowski's works in conjunction with the Tanzanian development model, as well as the, the success in China, it does at least open the debate over the assumed universality of democratisation. In parts of the developing world, financial security is of greater importance than political and civil rights a view alluded to by Bogang He when referring to Chinese peasants' demands for money outweighing their demand for democracy. Moving now on to the theme of war and development, looking at evidence on how war has affected development outcomes in developing countries in Africa, whilst also quantifying the relative significance of war as a development obstacle. Stuart and Wilson have emphasised how the costs of war extend beyond physical casualties. In terms of development, Stuart and Wilson equate the costs of war with the destruction of existing capital, defined as human, institu institutional and social cultural capital. The Stuart model suggests human costs of war to be analysed at a macro, meso and micro level, thus arguing for the holistic impact of war upon development. Focusing on the human costs of war reveals how, at a micro level, the gross national product of a country is likely to fall. This triggers meso-level costs, as funding for specific sectors, most commonly in socio-economic areas of health and education, are diverted into military expenditure. At a micro level, this reduces the entitlements of citizens and reduction in proportion of earnings, thus affecting human development outcomes. They reveal amongst all, all the countries studied, income per capita decreased during the 1980s. That sought to criticise the Washington Consensus, Structural Adjustment Programmes, or SAPs, which reduced government expenditure, such as food subsidies and reduced price controls. Thus, they suggested that the World Bank and the IMF re-evaluate the SAP policies for developing countries engaged in conflict. However, a factor that is understated by these authors is the social recovery from armed conflict. Nordstrom has encapsulated the scale of social recovery and its effect on development outcomes. I quote, As people look out over a ruined landscape that was once home, now shorn of the livelihood, humanity and hope, they cannot simply reconstruct society as it was before. For in the violence and upheaval, it cannot be, and may never be, the same as it was before. This sense of sheer destruction, which not only affects economic resources, 
but also is seen to weaken societal, communal and family level structures and their decision making systems, which are key aspects to driving development. The acceptance that war hampers development outcomes in terms of reducing GDP, meso sector spending, individual entitlements and the capacity to rebuild psycho- after psychological trauma leads to further questions about the role of security within development discourse. It has been argued by scholars such as Fakunda Parr that in order to prevent the continuation of war as an obstacle to development, it should not be considered as a separate issue, thus bringing the security and development agenda into harmony with the Millennium Security Goals. This concept was, however, not considered by the UNDP's most recent report published in 2014, which advocated global governance to institutionalise the reduction in vulnerability and building the capacity of resilience amongst communities in the face of adversity. Whilst these emphases have potentially positive outcomes to dealing with obstacles to development, such as armed conflict, it fails to address the key issue of the international arms trade, which shoulders great responsibility for the existence of armed conflicts across the world. Fakunda Parr argues that incorporated into potential um, MSGs would be a regulated arms trade. This in the context of a world where since 1945, 120 civil conflicts have occurred in the developing world, costing approximately 20 million lives. Indeed, it has been argued that a link exists between foreign influence and military coups in Africa. An example of this revealed by documentary evidence in the case of Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This evidence suggests that British oil company Soko International has funded the militant Congolese Revolutionary Army in order to depose the leader of Virunga National Park, Prince Emmanuel de Merode who is preventing Soko from extracting oil. As a result of the documentary, an international campaign has emerged in order to generate global awareness of the neo-colonialist attitudes of certain transnational corporations. With increased trade liberalisation ensuring greater availability of weaponry, it is to no surprise that the spending on arms in the developing world has increased in the last 20 years. In 2009, it was recorded that military spending in sub-Saharan Africa had increased by 42% in real terms since 2000. This increase in military budgets refers us back to the Stuart model of human costs of war, because increasing military spending reduces spending in other meso-level sectors, such as health and education. In terms of human development perspective, these sectors are of greater importance in providing the basic needs for citizens. For example, Ethiopia has military spending at 10% of GDP, compared to 1.5% on healthcare. Furthermore, these Ethiopian meso-level budgets are in the context of high maternal mortality rates at 420 per 100,000, recorded in 2013. Indeed, a factor to consider is that the global expenditure on the military is three times that of the figure required to enable universal healthcare across the world. It is therefore curious that the UNDP 2014 report into sustaining human progress focused more on the response to civil conflict rather than focusing on Fukunda Parr's suggestion of integrating security and development goals. Moving now on to the focus of policy implementation, I'll suggest that a considerable obstacle to development is the the difficulty in implementing well-considered development policies, revealing inherent cultures of corruption within the developing world. Increased awareness of development as a global governance issue has at the same time highlighted greater issues of policy implementation at national, regional and local levels. 
Brezhnev suggests that the global policy agenda on sustainable development has been dominated by a search for new and innovative steering mechanisms, such as target-seeking mechanisms and the integration of science into the policy-making process. However, whilst policy ideas should be subject to scrutiny from a plurality of actors, this process is fundamentally insignificant when focus is not directed into the policy implementation process. Indeed, Brezes reveals that studies in the 1970s and 80s presented the implementation phases as the real bottleneck for achieving change. Perhaps the greatest obstacle to development could be understood as a lack of harmonious agreement between the developed world and the developing world, which has been evident in the troubled relationship between policy formulation and the policy implementation process. The issue of street-level bureaucracy in Uganda suggests that policy implementers may not share the same values and interests and are thus not sufficiently motivated to implement the policy, proving an obstacle to the development process. However, it may not prove to be a matter of motivation. Local policy implementers may not have sufficient information to carry out the, the policy effectively. For example, Grass's questions whether there is an awareness of who the policy is targeted at and what the target group stands to gain from the policy or in Riddle's terms, the why and qualitative values of development. Furthermore, corruption and policy implementation are contributing factors to undermining human development because it erodes respect for the law and teaches people that honest work is not where the rewards are to be found. Studies into oil-rich countries such as Azerbaijan have revealed that evidence of situational corruption exists meaning a culture of corruption amongst Azerbaijani people as opposed to specific senior individuals. Herod's fight and Bonham's application of social attribution theory, which studies efforts of people to explain their behaviour, reveals that despite maintaining significant oil resources, inherent corruption amongst Azerbaijani people will prevent the implementation of a fair distribution of wealth. Through focusing on the policy implementation process, I've revealed, in essence, the political nature of development, as obstacles to development can occur because no coherent implementation strategy is evident from global to local institutions. This argument has been a core criticism of the Millennium Development Goals, where the policy goals were formulated by Western organisations such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, rather than in-depth consultation with developing countries. This sense of detraction between policy formulation and policy implementation suggests that no matter what the global sustainable development agenda is, if it cannot be effectively implemented at national, regional and local levels, it will be ineffective and masks any significant progress in effective regional development and improvement in the basic needs of human beings. This lecture has grappled with the question of what the greatest obstacle to development could be. The abstract nature of this exercise makes definitive conclusions difficult to achieve. By that token, not one of the factors explored in this lecture can claim to be the greatest obstacle to development. However, through exploring themes of democracy, war and policy implementation, some concluding ju judgments can be made. Firstly, it appears that systemic issues are greater obstacles to development than roles of specific agents within the global system. For example, increased trade liberalisation and the increased availability of the arms trade can encourage violent conflict as the primacy of global trade usurps promoting human development. Secondly, alternative models of development explored in the case study of China reveal that if development was considered in terms of micro-level economics, perhaps the systemic push towards democratisation is not necessary for development. 
Finally, the global governance system has proved ineffective in terms of distinguishing policy formulation from policy implementation. And it is this fundamental oversight that needs to be addressed in order to reduce future obstacles to development. It is difficult defining development in exact terms. The differing models across the world lead to a lack of unified understanding of what development means, resulting with the primacy of global trade and economics tending to outweigh the potential obstacles to pro progress in human development. It is perhaps by that token that the greatest obstacle to development is the contested, fundamentally political nature of development. It is the lack of uniformity amongst political actors, whether global or local, as to what development means. To what extent is development about ensuring people have the socio-economic security? Or is development to be interpreted as ensuring the primacy of political and civil rights? The models examined here suggest differing models work in different regions. It is these questions that must collaborate into one coherent development agenda at a global, national and local level. Thus contemporary understanding of development as a contested political term is a statement that reveals 